Hey guys, Silent Seal here. Welcome to the first ever review for this YouTube channel. So yes, it is the first time I'm reviewing a movie. You know, if you guys like such videos like this in the future, um, let me know your thoughts in the comment section down below. Of course, leaving a like on this video will let me know um, that you want more. So guys, um, this video will contain both spoiler-free information and spoiler-filled information as well. So guys, if you want to hear spoiler-filled information, just stay towards the full end. Um, for those who are staying for spoiler-free content, I will definitely let you guys know once we are diving into spoiler territory. So guys, before we begin, um, I just want to promote a bit on my last video. You can see the the poster at the back here yes it's the ghostbusters afterlife teaser poster so if you guys want me to want to see how i opened this up or unpacked it or unboxed it check out my past video um you know it's it's on my channel just just look for it <laughs> uh, and check it out uh, i do talk about how big of a ghostbusters fan i i am on that video and of course as you can see from the shirt I am definitely a huge Ghostbusters fan. I have figures somewhere laying around the house as well. It's just sadly to say I don't have the space to put them around. I don't have my own room to do this. I'm doing this in my living room. So anyways, um, if you're wondering if I'm doing this review after watching the movie, technically yes and no. Because um, I'm doing this review right after watching the movie for the second time. <laughs> so... Um, if you guys watched the unboxing video for the poster, you guys will probably know that I watched the first screening on the 17th of November. Um, that was the early screening in my country. I didn't manage to see like the fans preview. Um, I sadly was working then. Uh, it was technically my last day of work before something happened. So <laughs> anyways, um, yeah, so technically, I officially watched Ghostbusters Afterlife on the 17th of November, which is the earliest screening, um, you know, once the movie was released in the country. So, I watched both movies uh, with two different experiences. The first one on the 17th of November was a digital format release, so that was uh, viewed in a regular cinema with a 7.1 Dolby surround system. Um, then, of course, today, which is the 20th of November that I'm recording this review, uh, I went to watch it with the IMAX experience. So, um, the only difference between the two is technically the IMAX experience is a larger screen um, with, a, with more speakers surrounding the whole theatre. Um, so, the sound quality is definitely a lot more... Um, it gives a lot more oomph. Uh, so, if you guys are huge Ghostbusters fans and you would love to hear the exquisite sounds of the proton pack humming or the neutrono horn being blasted, IMAX is definitely the way to go. Uh, or if you want to hear the sirens of the actual one whirling away, you know, IMAX is the best you can go. But of course, if you're planning to watch Ghostbusters Afterlife, again and again and again because it's that good that's why i'm watching it twice no actually i'm watching it a total of maybe four times <laughs> because i have three groups of friends and i want to watch it with them because i introduced ghostbusters to them and i wanted to see their experiences and i love the movie so much that i want to watch it again and again so yes if you're planning to do it exactly like i did um digital is definitely the way to go so you can save a bit of the, the moolah because imax is definitely not cheap so guys before we begin with all the information on the review um let me uh let me tell you guys first what you probably need to prepare yourself for before you dive into this movie the first thing you need to do is you definitely need to watch the original Ghostbusters movie, the 1984 film. Um, it's not necessary, you need to watch Ghostbusters 2, um, which was um, first released in 1989. It's not necessary, but it's probably ideal because you probably need some information on certain things before you understand why this happened in Ghostbusters Afterlife. So, um, then of course, if you're wondering, do you need to know the real Ghostbusters, which is the cartoon, which is where this logo is from. 
Uh, as you can tell, it's not your regular uh, Ghostbusters logo. As you can tell from the shirt, it says the real Ghostbusters. Yes, this is the logo for the cartoon series, the real Ghostbusters. And of course, there is also the Extreme Ghostbusters and of course, Ghostbusters, the video game. So if you guys want to check out Ghostbusters, the video game, my YouTube channel is luckily a gaming channel mostly. So I did cover Ghostbusters, the video game on this channel as well. So you can just head over to the playlist section and watch the entire playthrough of me going, uh, experiencing Ghostbusters, the video game. If you want to know the story of Ghostbusters, the video game, which is technically Ghostbusters 3. And no, Ghostbusters Afterlife is not Ghostbusters 3. In fact, Ghostbusters Afterlife is technically Ghostbusters 1.5 or Ghostbusters 4. <laughs> so I will explain why is it 1.5 and number 4 in the film order uh, in the spoiler portion of the video. If you guys want to know about that, you can stick around then. But of course, if you don't want to know too much, um, just watch the movie, then come back for the spoiler content later on. Um, and yeah, learn your Ghostbusters history. So anyways, guys, um, the other thing we need to mention is that if you want to experience this movie spoiler-free or at least with an um, enjoyable mindset, I would highly recommend you to stay away from all the trailers that has been released for Ghostbusters Afterlife. Uh, if you have to watch a few trailers, watch the first two that was ever released. Do not watch um, the third trailer and the final trailer. Uh, basically, it's the international trailer and the final trailer. Those two are filled with too much plot stories given away, um, which kind of ruined my first experience a bit. Um, so, yeah, anyways, We'll talk about that later um, as we dive into the spoiler-free content. Um, so yeah, the other thing you need to take a note of is that today, as of today, the 20th of November, Ghostbusters Afterlife soundtrack is available on all streaming platforms. We have Apple Music, iTunes, um, we have Spotify, we have Amazon Music. You can probably check it out. But there's one thing you really, really need to take note of is that the soundtrack's naming uh, kind of gives away the movie a bit, a bit. So if you really, really want to go into this movie spoiler-free, stay away from all the streaming music for Ghostbusters Afterlife. Um, maybe check it out later after you watch the movie. Um, even though the soundtrack is mwah, beautiful because it is just a modern-day rendition of the old Ghostbusters soundtrack but with some neuter elements as well. Um, it's it's still a fantastic soundtrack so I'm definitely going to uh, pre-order the soundtrack and get the audio CD as well. Yeah and I hope that eventually they, they will release um, a vinyl soundtrack for Ghostbusters Afterlife as well just like they did for Ghostbusters 1 and Ghostbusters 2 recently. So yeah very very hyped for it. So anyway guys let's dive into spoiler-free conversation about Ghostbusters Afterlife. Um, you probably need to know one thing. Whatever we're going to talk about here has already been shown in the trailers. So even though it may sound spoilery, but it is been officially released by Sony Pictures. So it's technically not spoiler. Um, information so if you guys feel like it's too much to handle um, I understand if you want to click away go watch the movie come back to it later on and just see if my conversations with you guys actually match with your feelings about the movies um, or maybe you can take it with a grain of salt because I am definitely a hardcore fan of Ghostbusters my opinions may be a bit more different for casual viewers uh, or people who are just being um, brought in into the Ghostbusters franchise. So take note of that and let's talk about spoiler-free content. First things off, we all know that this movie is all about family bonds and the legacy of the Ghostbusters franchise because we are following Phoebe who is the granddaughter of Egon Spangler 
one of the four original Ghostbusters. Um, so rest in peace, Harold Ramis. So you guys need to know that, you know, the actor who played Egon Spangler has passed away um, for quite some time now. And this movie is definitely um, a tribute to Harold um, because it pays, respect, it pays respect to the character Egon, um, as we can see from the trailers very very beautifully um and you know it's it's just awesome that this time round we get to experience ghostbusters from his family members his granddaughter phoebe and of course his daughter um who is the mom um and you know and of course we have trevor which is the grandson um who is also the stranger things male actor so if you guys are wondering um I've, I've never watched stranger things yes i know it sounds impossible uh stranger things also also had a ghostbuster cameo uh, i'm not not from the original team but they they wore ghostbuster halloween costumes in one of the season starts uh i know about stranger things because of that uh, and until now, I've not watched Stranger Things. And a lot of the reviewers out there have been comparing this to Stranger Things as well. So that is not going to happen in my review because I've not watched Stranger Things. So yeah. <laughs> Anyways, I, I'm not familiar with his works with Stranger Things. Um, so I can't really say if it's really similar to that or not. So anyways, um, we are looking at it from... Spangler's family um, point of view and of course the main person involved with this whole story is Phoebe which is the granddaughter um, acted by Mac uh, McKenna, McKenna Grace so she is really really good as, a, as an actress she really played it perfectly and do take note this movie was actually finished in 2019 <laughs> and it's two years from from now and she has really grown up to be a really wonderful lady um well technically she's not a lady yet she's still a young girl um but you know she's growing up fine and she's maturing um uh, perfectly well and compared to what we see in the movie she's a lot older uh, you know and a lot more graceful i guess um so she's a wonderful actress she hits the the spot of um, a lot of scenes very very perfectly um, it gives me it gives me a lot of uh, ooh, that kind of feeling <laughs> that, that that is going on in the movie um, because I, I felt like I was experiencing um, her point of view as in like the horror the, the excitement the curiosity uh, of finding out you know certain things that's going on throughout this whole show so perfectly acted character um, by McKenna Grace and of course the rest of the, the rest of the team the uh, rest of the actors are wonderful as well especially personally for me I really really like the the chemistry between Phoebe and podcast and of course Phoebe and uh, Paul Rudd's character Gary Gooberson, um, the teacher, and of course the mom. The mom, mom is a fantastic actress as well. She she pulled it off pretty fantastically. Um, you know, some people might cringe at what was revealed with the mom later on. You know, it's it's spoiler content, so I'm just gonna leave it as that. Um, you know, but I think she did it pretty well. Um, then of course. Um, Paul Rudd, we don't have to say he's hilarious as hell. <laughs> it, 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 his comedy is just also natural. Um, but personally for myself, I feel like the movie is lacking uh, in certain things. Uh, first off, let me just mention that I feel like um, the, the, the guy that plays um, Trevor... The Stranger Things actor, um, and of course the the the, the actress who played Lucky, um, their roles seem very minuscule. Uh, it wasn't really flushed uh, out, and I don't really feel for them. It feels like it feels like they are there just for the sake of it, um, and it felt very. I, 
the chemistry is not that strong um, and you don't really relate with them that well so that's my personal view on it I watched it twice like I said um, so the first experience was the digital experience and the first experience for me personally I felt like I went in watching like a critic um, because I I kind of felt like I was trying to judge the film's pacing uh, because I'm writing a review or planning to do a review <laughs> so that's what um, that's why I would feel this way so this is what I felt I felt like the first portion of the movie was really slow because the whole por first portion was building up bonds with the characters um, we, we get to learn more about the Spangler, Spangler family what has happened to them and why they are moving out to the countryside and you know um, taking over the grandfather's property um, then of course later on like how um, Phoebe uh, finds out you know that their grandfather is a ghostbuster uh, and of course eventually you know they are they are testing out the equipment and all that kind of stuff so it felt very slow at the beginning portion of my first viewing because um, like I said, it's not your traditional Ghostbusters uh, formula. Um, it is definitely uh, having its own flair thanks to Jason Reitman, who is the, the current director for um, Ghostbusters Afterlife, who is also the son of the original Ghostbusters director, uh, Ivan Reitman. So his specialty is definitely family-based oriented stories in all the movies that he's just done. Um, basically bonds between characters so that's why this movie is very strong in that factor um, it's about a movie uh, a, a movie of fa about the family who explores their leg legacy behind um, one of the family members so yeah so the first portion is kind of draggy but it wasn't unenjoyable um, then of course it hits fast when it goes into the climax um, so it's I guess the slow portion was really just to build up that final moment um, and it doesn't it doesn't take out it doesn't take away the experience from the whole show uh, the other things that I want to talk about is that you know the the nostalgia factor for this whole movie is definitely because it calls back from the original 1984 Ghostbusters film it is technically a continuation for that show um, which is kind of strange because like I said earlier in the, the, the review it felt like this movie was a 1.5 Ghostbusters movie instead of a Ghostbusters 4 and I'll explain why it should be technically Ghostbusters 4 instead of Ghostbusters 3 <laughs> so anyways um, yeah, so it felt strange. <laughs> so aside from the pacing of the movie, everything else felt wonderful. Um, initially for my first screening, I felt like the movie's music placement kind of was out of place at certain points of time. It's, it felt like it felt like they were using remade modernized version of the original Ghostbusters soundtrack and they were just tossing in it uh, tossing in at it randomly uh, like certain points it just didn't match that's my that's my first viewing experience so like I said I was watching it kind of like a critic mindset so it, it felt like maybe my judgment on that portion of the, the movie uh, aspect is kind of off um, because when I watched it a second time and I paid closer attention to the soundtrack and when it was you know um, played at certain points of the movie the second time it felt perfectly fine I don't know because the second time I watched the movie I went in to enjoy the movie uh, and I was ready to absorb more than I was watching it in the first time um, because I was ready to really, really bond with the characters, um, to go along with the ride and follow the pace of the movie by itself, rather than me trying to force myself into the pacing of the movie, like picking up 
things that you know that isn't feeling technically right compared to the first movie um so i let the movie be its own thing in the second viewing and i thoroughly enjoyed it throughout without finding a hint of problems that i originally did in my first viewing um and the slow portion of the movie ended up being over instantaneously in the second viewing in fact i felt like it wasn't even a drag and the movie just ended beautifully for me in the second viewing so yeah i guess you know going into the film with a different mindset really affects your viewing pleasure if you're going in to judge the movie as it is it might end up being a horrible experience um, but if you're just going in as a a movie goer who's wanting more for Ghostbusters or if you're a Ghostbusters hardcore fan like I am um, and you're just going there to take the ride in the actor one along with the kids it's going to be an enjoyable time so guys please go in this movie with this consideration in your mind don't don't be too judgmental on the movie it's a good movie um, it doesn't deserve to be criticized like most of the critics are doing who apparently likes the 2016 Ghostbusters Answer the Call movie and is kind of shitting on this one because it omits the 2016 movie which obviously personally for myself I think it should be omitted because personally for myself that movie has been left in the corner to collect dust <laughs> <laughs> so anyways um, the only other thing I really need to tell you about this movie is that you know aside from it being enjoyable the actors and actresses are wonderful the music score is fantastic as well it's just it's just a, a rehash of the old original Ghostbusters soundtrack and a bit more with a modern take so it's fine you know, um, the movie is fantastic from beginning to end. Um, just that one last thing. You need to prepare tissues. Because you are definitely going to cry. Um, that's the main reason why I asked you to watch the original 1984 Ghostbusters before diving into this one. Because if you don't, you will not understand the finale. <laughs> uh, oh yes, one other thing. Yes, we all know by now. Um, I guess I did mention earlier in the, in the video. Um, the actor who played Egon Spangler has passed away. So yeah. Oh yes, one last thing. So before you go off to watch the movie in the cinemas, you need to stay to the end of the credits. There are two end credit sequences basically one after they've introduced all the cast name um so yeah that will be the first end credit sequence then roughly about three to four minutes after all the rest of the credits have been shown you know revealing like the the um the crews that were involved with the um effects the props and all that stuff once that credit sequence ends there is a second end credit sequence both of them are must to stay for especially if you have nostalgia for the 1984 ghostbusters film which technically you should be watching first before you go to this one so yes guys stay tuned for those two okay so with everything done and said we are now stepping into spoiler filled territory so i'm going to give you guys a bit of time here um let me know your thoughts in the comment section down below if you guys um wanting to watch this movie spoiled free of course the comment section down below might be filled with spoiler content comments so avert your eyes if not um type your comments on a notepad somewhere and copy and paste and then run away from the comment section immediately i don't know this is the first movie review that i'm doing in the comment section maybe bare bones dry who knows 
nobody's going to watch my content unless you guys do your job like share subscribe you know the share is very important especially if you want to spread the word around <laughs> anyways guys giving you guys a moment are you guys ready let's step into spoiler territory so first things off um i have actually written a whole bunch of notes on my phone regarding the movie while i was watching the movie so as you can see this from this from this spacing here this wall of text is actually spoiler information so <laughs> That's a lot to talk about. So first thing first, I'm going to read this off of my notes. This is in accordance to when it appeared in the movie. So like I said, I've already, I've already given you guys your spoiler warning break. If you have not clicked away and you're still staying on, it means you are just asking for it because you want it and you... You want to know more, I guess, or maybe you just want to spoil yourself because you like to watch, you like to spoil yourself before watching the show. Who knows? There are some people like that. I have I have friends who are like that, so it's it baffles me, but it it is a thing. So anyway, guys, here we go. The movie is a throwback to Zoo and the Chair. <laughs> so that is probably one of the first things you notice, um, because it it, it happens. Um, in the movie where they are trying to show Egon before he passed away. <laughs> so, Egon was killed in the chair. And of course, Zhu being the terror dog, as we all know from the original 1984, so Jason Reitman throws back to that scene where uh, Dana Barrett in her apartment was sitting on the sofa and then you have that, you know, all the, the arms sticking out and then... <laughs> so, <laughs> so yeah, that's how Egon dies. Um, so yeah, that's the throwback to the 1984 film. Um, so that's pretty, pretty, pretty nice of them, in fact, um, you know, to, to kill off Egon in this way. So I, I don't know. Personally, for me, I, I, I kind of enjoyed that that death scene but um i guess some of the critics might think that it's too much nostalgia but it was kind of appropriate since after all we are still handling the um the same paradox that were, were in the original 1984 um then the next thing we're going to talk about is that when egon dies he drops the pke meter that he's holding in his um, right hand and the pke meter is uh, hidden under the, the sofa that he was killed on um, and when he dies the PKE meter lights up so if you guys know your history on what the PKE meter does it basically is a device to detect um, the trace of a ghost basically it, it shows you where the ghost has actually traveled um, so yeah so when the PKE meter lights up it means there's a presence nearby so when Egon dies and the PKA meter lights up, it basically means that Egon's ghost is lingering around the house. So yeah, that was that was kind of my pickup on it because I think a lot of people did not understand the technology of the PKA meter. So that's why this information is in the spoiler portion of this video and as you can tell i'm sitting up closer to the camera because i am very excited for this uh, i need to let it out uh, so the next thing is egon has never met his daughter as they were growing up um, because technically he ran away from the family we don't know who the wife is actually so we know that Egon has a daughter, he has grandkids, he was technically married, I guess, but we don't know who the wife is because um, later on, as seen in the trailers, we see Annie Potts who plays um, the, the secretary in the original Ghostbusters, Janine Melnitz. Um, she comes back into the house and she calls herself a friend 
of Egon Spangler. So, a lot of us as Ghostbusters fans have been hoping for the two of them to get, you know, pitched together. Because um, Janine has always liked Egon. Um, she had romantic feelings for him in the 1984 Ghostbusters film and the real Ghostbusters series. So, technically, the Ghostbusters fans have always wanted the two of them to get together and get married. I, I was speculating before um, the movie um, came out for viewing. I've always thought that Janine probably married uh, Egon and of course she, she might be the mother but apparently when the movie finally came out she wasn't. So she was just a good, really good friend to Egon. So that that threw me off <laughs> but I, I was okay with it. So that's fine. We got to see you know, Annie Potts return. She's one of my favorite actresses. Um, she's she's done Young Sheldon. She has done so many other things that I I really really love. Um, she's well Bo Peep in Toy Story. So <laughs> so anyways, um, so yeah. Anyways, moving along. Did you guys know that Ray? while talking with Winston in the original 1984 um, Ghostbusters series while they were driving in the Ecto-1 then they, they uh, referred to uh, a Bible verse Revelations um, 7.12 I remember Revelations 7.12 And I looked as he opened the sixth seal and behold there was a great earthquake and the sun became as black as sackcloth and the moon became as blood the seas boiled and the skies fell. Judgment day. Judgment day. Uh, did you know that that verse when they mentioned is actually technically wrong? Um, the actual Bible verse was Revelation 6, 12. So they corrected this in Ghostbusters Afterlife when the kids and the mom reach the farmhouse. Um, they find some Bible verse uh, scripture being scribbled on some metal fences and yes they corrected the verse number so they actually stated it as revelations 6 12 so yes that's pretty interesting so all right next thing is egon plays chess with phoebe <laughs> so it's pretty interesting now here's the thing here is the thing this is actually not the first time that Egon has become a ghost. I'm sure a lot of you who are only fans of the Ghostbuster movies will not know this because Go Egon has actually become a ghost before in the real Ghostbuster series. So yes, if you look at season 2 um, episode, I think it was 20 or something. I can't really remember which episode number, but um, yeah, Egon actually becomes a ghost in the real Ghostbusters cartoon series. So technically, this isn't the first time that this is a thing. So maybe, maybe because Egon has already experienced what it is like to be a spirit before. Um, and, you know, so that's why he is willing to pass away in the real life uh, and to haunt his current living quarters so that maybe later on when his family comes to retrieve his um, belongings and all that kind of stuff he can guide them because he's already learned how to uh, make use of his spirit powers you know to, to lift up objects you know and toss things around that kind of stuff so Take note of that. <laughs> so, alright, moving along. Did you guys know that Ivan Reitman's very first movie name was actually in Ghostbusters Afterlife? So, there is this particular scene, I think it was seen in the trailers as well, um, where Podcast was kind of like doing a recording with Phoebe and they were walking in front of like a cinema billboard or something like that and the name of Ivan Reitman's first movie, Cannibal Girls, shows up <laughs> in the background as well. So that's a pretty interesting Easter egg for those Ivan Reitman um, fans out there. So 
I kind of knew that because I was watching um, the movie that made us on Netflix and of course Ghostbusters was one of the topics and of course Ivan Reitman during the interview was talking about um, his past work so Cannibal Girls was actually brought up so fun easter egg you know, right there for the real hardcore fans <laughs> alright moving along we have um, did you guys know that when Phoebe pulls the ghost trap out from the hole in the ground that was actually seen in the trailers um, the ghost trap was not attached to a pedal if you guys take note of that so if you guys are familiar with the original ghostbusters you know that the ghost trap is actually rolled on the floor and you have to step on a pedal to activate the ghost trap to open so when phoebe pulls the trap out it was not attached to a pedal but the movie cuts to the school with phoebe and podcast having the ghost trap on a table which can be seen in the movie trailer as well and there it is, the ghost trap is attached to a pedal. But where did Phoebe get the pedal from? Um, because at the point of this movie where she pulls out the ghost trap, she has not found the other equipment um, that Egon has created for the Ghostbusters business. So it was technically impossible for her to have a pedal attached to the ghost trap. So that's that's pretty hilarious of um, strange editing, but you know. Okay, moving along. So uh, Paul Rudd in the trailer was holding the ghost trap and he was like looking at it and then it, it glows and has smoke in the air um, as seen in the trailer. Did you know that particular scene is different in the final cut of the movie? So if you went to check the trailer's um, especially that scene with Paul Rudd holding the trap the effects in the trailers are a lot nicer compared to the final cut in the movie the final cut of the movie is just like a tiny bit of smoke there is no light not much light glowing unlike the trailer and then he just drops the ghost trap because he's like wait this this thing is real yeah so so interesting fact about the the difference between the final cut and the trailer all right moving along so did you guys know that there was a deleted scene in the original 1984 Ghostbuster film um, basically with Jason Reitman as a young boy um, back on the set with his dad during the original filming of the 1984 Ghostbusters with his mom um, and I think dog uh, and, and sister as well I think because the mom was carrying a, a baby and then he was right beside her so they were at the 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 final building where the final final battle with Gozer was and um, they ran out of the building so that scene was technically deleted off from the 1984 film and it can only be seen um, in the Ghostbusters anniversary blu-ray DVD sets so if you guys are hardcore fans you probably know what I'm talking about if not um, that scene was technically shown um, during the movie of Ghostbusters Afterlife um, and it was a brief quick second shot of the movie because that portion um, was then moved into where the actor one comes in to the, to the main final boss fight of the building um, and you know so that we are so familiar with in the last scenes of the original final Ghostbusters uh, movie so it was shown during the part where um, Mr. Gooberson was introducing Ghostbusters to Phoebe and podcast for the very first time saying that you guys didn't know what happened back then in New York City it was filled with ghosts and it was like everyone was everywhere was like filled with walking dead so yeah so that's that's a fun tribute to the original deleted scenes of the 1984 Ghostbusters film all right, so moving along, there is a lot of vehicles around my place today. Uh, so it's really hard to make YouTube videos in my neighborhood. So yeah, anyways, um, Aztec Death Whistle. Yeah, so did you, I'm sure you guys who are big Ghostbuster fans, you know what I'm talking about because Adam Savage, who has his own YouTube channel called Tested, um, and he has been collaborating with Ghostbusters Afterlife because he knows Jason Reitman. Um, so he was, you know, blessed enough 
to create a prop for Ghostbusters Afterlife and the Aztec Death Whistle is actually created by him. So if you guys want to check out his, um, I guess, one day build videos, go to his YouTube channel, Tested. Uh, I would leave a link in the description down below for you guys to go and check it out as well. Um, where he creates the Aztec Death Whistle and then he brings it to the set to hand over to Jason Reitman. So that's fantastic stuff. So, all right, moving along. Um, the fire pole is still a thing. <laughs> so, yes, um, even though we don't have the firehouse in Ghostbusters Afterlife, but apparently, I think in Egon has a thing for the fire pole since they've been using it for so long. So apparently he built a fire pole <laughs> in in the the barn portion of the, the farm where he has his this hidden basement for all his Ghostbuster gear. So when Phoebe is led by Egon to that basement to check out the equipment and all that kind of stuff, um, she had to use the fire pole to 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 you know get down into the basement to, to, to check out all of the gear. So yeah, the fire pole is still a thing. <laughs> so that's a pretty nice thing. Uh, and who doesn't like sliding down the fire pole? Let's, let's be honest. I mean, I've never, sl I've never sl uh, slid down one, but I would definitely love to try one. Uh, it, looks, it looks fun. <laughs> all right, so moving along. Um, for the fans of the original 1984 Ghostbusters film, I'm sure you guys are familiar with the scene where Peter uh, Peter Venkman forgives Egon and then he gives him a crunch bar. Always serious. Egon, I'm going to take back some of the things I said about you. You've, you've earned it. When Phoebe pulls the, uh, the jerseys or the flight suits aside and you see the Spangler name tag, um, Later on in the movie, she reaches her hand into the pockets on the flight suits and she pulls out a wrapper of the crunch bar that was actually given to by Peter Venkman. So that's a pretty nice easter egg, but would you actually touch that wrapper that has been inside the flight suit for so many years? It's, it's 1984 and it's 2021. That's how many years that crunch bar has been inside that thing. <laughs> <laughs> oh god. Anyways, uh, it's a pretty nice um, nostalgia throwback to when Egon and um, Peter um, you know, reunited as really good friends because something happened. We don't know what it was in the original 1984 film, but it cleared up, so good for them. Alright, moving along. E uh, Phoebe also pulls out something else from the flight suit, which is the glasses of Egon, then she puts it up to her face right in front of her own personal specs. So then the fans get to see that, oh, Egon and Phoebe's glasses share the same type of frame, which is a very nice thing to do to say that Phoebe is the next Egon Spangler. So we all know she's smart. Um, she's the tech genius in the family unlike her mom and her brother. Um, so that's the thing. So speaking of traits of um, the characters, Phoebe is definitely Egon in the original Ghostbusters, but a lot of the reviewers have got it wrong for the other three characters. Well, technically for, the, for two of them. Um, we know for the fact that Podcast is the new Ray Stans. So he's the, the lively, enthousi enthusiastic comedic uh, relief like Ray was in the original 1984 film. However, however, for Lucky and Trevor, most of the reviewers got it wrong. <laughs> so, Trevor is not the new Peter Venkman. Trevor is the new Winston Zedmore. <laughs> because, if you guys didn't know, the only other Ghostbuster who actually fixes the Ecto-1 it's actually Winston. That's why Winston is so close to Ray Stans uh, back in the day in the original 1984 film when he was talking about Revelations 712, the wrong number, uh, in the original 1984 film. Um, and of course, in the real Ghostbusters series, um, we get to see Winston work on the Ecto-1 as well, uh, aside from Ray. 
So it's pretty strange because um, later on we see the spirit of Egon fixing the Ecto-1 for Trevor. So Trevor is fixing the Ecto-1 and he's trying to start the Ecto-1. But apparently there was a wire that was not fully attached so that's why the Ecto-1 couldn't start. So the spirit of Egon twists the wire and puts it in for him and then the engine can turn on. Um, so it's pretty strange that the that they show Egon is capable of free, uh, fixing the Cadillac which is the Ecto-1 um, which is not a thing that's commonly seen in any of the Ghostbusters properties because we don't really see Egon fixing the car most of the time he's tinkering away at the the tech like fi um, building uh, special upgrades for the proton pack um, the PKE meter, the, the Giga meter you know, the ghost traps and all that kind of stuff the next thing we want to talk about is actually Egon's brain experiments. So if you guys remember the scene in the 1984 film... Egon, this reminds me of the time you tried to drill a hole through your head. Remember that? That would have worked if you hadn't stopped no, me. I'm yes, Egon tried to drill a hole in his head for brain experiments and Interestingly enough, when Phoebe was down in the basement, on the wall where they showed some x-ray scans, there is the scans of Egon's brain. <laughs> so, I don't know, did Egon actually do his brain experience? I don't know. If, if he did, and he's still alive, it actually worked. <laughs> <laughs> Alright, so that's the thing for you hardcore Ghostbusters fans. I wonder if you spotted it yourself. I definitely did. Uh, and it was pretty hilarious. <laughs> Alright, when Phoebe finally pulls or fixes the proton pack with the help of Egon, um, she tested the pack out. So um, unlike the 2016 film, we get a pretty good test of the proton pack. The feet are planted. Her face is poised. Yeah! With um, Phoebe's character, of course. So she does this as seen in the trailers. So um, podcast helps her switch on the proton pack. So I'm sure most of you guys are pretty familiar with this particular scene. Let's get ready. Switch me on. Now, we can see that Egon switches the proton pack on, but we were never shown the on switch on the proton pack. So, this is the first time any Ghostbuster property has actually showed the on switch on the Ghostbusters pack. So, that's pretty cool. Alright, so next thing is Phoebe turns on the wand in the wrong order. So, Okay, so this thing is a bit hard to explain um, because I have not created my unboxing video for the Neutrono one or rather the Spangler's Neutrono one or the Proton Thrower is some, some, some of you guys are familiar with the term if you don't understand Neutrono one um, basically it's the, the gun for the Proton Pack so um, there is an on sequence for the switches on the Neutrono on. So Phoebe actually in the movie she switches on the activate switch which is where the blasting button is first and then she turns on the other two switches on the main body of the Neutrono one. So that is actually the wrong order. I don't know if many of you hardcore fans noticed this but I did. <laughs> so because um, I, I've yet to upload my Neutrono one unboxing so I know what is going on. So the proper order for activating the Neutrono one is to activate the two switches. You can switch them on in any particular way but the main two switches on the main body of the Neutrono one which is the big black chunk in the middle, you switch them on first before you flick on the activate switch. The activate switch is your safety switch. So like any revolver or gun out there, there's always a safety switch. Like the Neutrono one, the activate switch is the safety switch. So if you don't activate the switches in the right order, you can't fire the Neutrono one. It works the exact same way as the Hasbro Spangler uh, Neutrono one, which is a replica of 
the actual prop used in this movie and the 1984 Ghostbusters Neutrono one. So here's a fun fact for you fans out there who are not hardcore Ghostbusters fans. <laughs> so here we go on the next thing is, did you guys know that Mancha is voiced by the voice actor who did Olaf in Frozen? I was shocked to find that out. So that's pretty interesting and he doesn't sound like him or rather any of the characters that you're so familiar with you know that he does characters for so hmm. all right moving along we have podcast use of the f s hack death whistle is like ray saying get her <laughs> so i'm sure you guys are very familiar with this particular scene stay close i know do exactly as i say get ready Get her! So it feels the same way when um, Podcast and Phoebe were kind of like cornered by Muncher in the factory. Um, so that's their first encounter with Muncher and Podcast having experienced the, um, the Aztec death whistle um, earlier. He, he thought he would use it and then to try and frighten or try to scare away Mancha, that kind of stuff. And he uses it, um, he blows into it trying to, you know, do something about Mancha. But it just felt, that whole sequence felt like Ray saying to the other guys, you know, follow me, I know what I'm doing, get her! Then... <laughs> <laughs> you get the iconic library scene. So yeah, it felt exactly like that, but it's just done in a different way. So I like I like how it's I, I like how it's actually a uh, tiny tribute if you guys are familiar with the the style um, of feeling that the, the, the that scene was giving. So yeah. Um, then of course the product placements in this movie, there's technically like only two product placements because um, we have the high C ecto cooler returning, which I have never drank before, um, because apparently we don't have this product here in Singapore, so only the American fans would probably know what it tastes like. And yes, they are getting the return of high C ecto cooler, uh, which is also produced by Coca Cola. So yes, Coca Cola gets a nice placement product um, in the movie uh, during the the date scene, I guess, with Mr. Gooberson and the mum. Then of course we have the obvious placement product with Ben and Jerry's because they made a limited edition mini Stay Puft Marshmallow Man um, collaboration with Funko Pop. So <laughs> product placement for uh, Ben and Jerry's. All right, moving along, we have a very strange one. So the thing of this, when Phoebe was in jail, or rather, yeah, in jail, and she called. Ray, I'm sure most of you guys will know um, the, the phone call because it's seen in the trailer. So Ray actually explains to Phoebe one thing that really, really seems a bit strange because the end sequence, yes, we're talking about end sequences now. There is one end sequence that doesn't make sense to what this statement that Ray made at this point in time in the movie. Ray said, that the old firehouse is no longer being used and is now a Starbucks. But the end sequence at the end showed that the, where the firehouse was deserted. It didn't even feel like it was built to be a Starbucks. It felt like it was just left to collect dust, like the Ghostbusters left the entire place there. Um, and, you know, it, it's just not built into a Starbucks. So. It felt strange. The, 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 the line that Ray provided didn't match the end sequence. So that's really, really strange. I'm, if you guys are wondering what I'm talking about, go check out the movie for yourself. Re-clarify. Uh, you can let me know in the comment section in, down below if I'm wrong because I've watched it twice. I've confirmed it myself. It just didn't seem right. So anyways, moving along. The Twinkie appears. <laughs> so yes, Egon's iconic Twinkie reappears as the kids um, get arrested and 
they had to open the glove compartment of the, the Ecto-1 and the pop comes out a Twinkie. <laughs> so that's that's pretty nice throwback. It, it's not as big as a Twinkie as I thought it would be, but it's still nice. Uh, it seems like Egon really likes his Twinkie, so... Mm. Okay, moving along, so... We are moving into the Walmart sequence. So I'm sure you guys have seen the Mini Stay Puffs uh, trailers out there. It's it's in the trailers. I'm sure you can notice it. But one of the Mini Puffs, uh, Mini Stay Puffs who are melting away in the barbecue fire did a Terminator <laughs> uh, reference. So that's pretty cute. All right, moving along. Um, Mr. Gooberson, Gary, doesn't say Hey buddy Like in the trailer So um, Like I said There are certain things in the movie trailers That have been changed uh, From the final product I don't know if the trailers were the ones that changed um, To make it look nicer Because it feels like The final film Is the before factor And the, the trailers are actually the after Edits So it just feels strange. Like um, the the spirits that escaped the mine shaft, um, the color was different. Original it was green. Then after that, the final sequence it was orangey red. So I don't know. Um, I don't know which came first, but it'll be pretty interesting to hear in the interview in the future for Ghostbusters Afterlife. Um, moving along. There is this reference that I think most of the old Ghostbusters fans would probably pick up on because it felt very, very similar, at least for me. Um, when Phoebe and the three other kids were talking about what is going on with uh, Somerville, uh, so they've already known about Gozer this, uh, and the, the, the Pterodox, we have Zoo. Uh, the key master, you know, that kind of stuff. So when they were talking about what is going on in Summerview and what Egon has been doing to protect the rest of the world, um, that discussion has the similar pacing of this one. Girders with cores of pure selenium. Everybody getting this so far? When you finally watch the movie yourself, let me know. Did it feel the same to you? Because as they were talking about Go uh, Gozer coming and, you know, what does it bring doom to the world? As the rest of the diner staff pay attention to their conversation, they turn around curiously, wanting to know what's going on. It felt exactly like what they did in 1984's Ghostbusters movie where... The four Ghostbusters were in the jail cell and then of course the other criminals start to pick up on what they are talking, you know, that kind of stuff. So it felt exactly like that. So if you guys remember the 1984 film where Ray and Peter Venkman were being kicked out of the university, um, there was this particular orange box device on wheels. That device appears in Ghostbusters Afterlife as well, but strangely enough, it's in Egon's basement. So the thing is, equipment such as this doesn't belong to them. It belongs to the, to the university. So how did Egon actually get one of those? Did he buy it himself or did he actually take it from the university? Hmm. <laughs> or maybe he could have, you know, had one already. Um, I don't know. Let you guys go ponder things out. So moving along, we have Muncha could have phased out of the cell instead of eating the bars. Okay, so this one is really a puzzler for me because I was thinking about this when I was watching it for the second time. Um, podcast idea was to set Muncha uh, free from the ghost trap uh, because the proton pack, the, the new RV or the, the ghost trap on the wheels, um, and all the other devices were locked behind a cell door that is unpickable uh, because Phoebe says this this lock is unpickable. So, um, so Podcast had this idea basically to set Muncher free so that he can eat the metal bars because he is a ghost that eats metal things. So when he sets Muncher free, in my mind, I was like, 
Munches is a ghost. If he was gonna escape, why doesn't he just fly through walls? Instead of eating the, the metal bars and then just flying away. So, <laughs> when you guys watch the movie, think about this. Or if you've seen the movie already because you're in the spoiler section, let me know your thoughts on this as well. Could this could this scene have been one of those like how it could have ended videos? <laughs> so anyways, um there's a there's a funny thought, anyways. Um moving along. Evo Shendor? Evo, Evo Shendor appears in this movie. Hmm. <laughs> so um, I know I don't know who the actor is. I know he's one of those iconic actors that has worked with Jason Reitman before. Um, a lot of the American f movie goer fans recognize him. I I personally don't recognize him. I don't watch a lot of movies. I only watch movies that really interest me. So um, so Evo Shendo is acted by this very iconic actor. I don't know who is he. Like I said. Um, but this is the first time Evo Shendor, Evo Shendor has appeared. So if you don't know who Evo Shendor is, he's basically the architect who has designed Dana Barrett's apartment. And of course, he is now the one who designed this shrine in Somerville um, to, to basically welcome Goza back into the, the world of humans. Excuse me. So, yeah. So when Goza revives, he literally... Well, it literally, because Goza is not a he nor a she. Um, so it's a pretty interesting thing that most of the young Americans nowadays find Goza pretty cool because of all the current situation between um, recognizing people as whichever gender they want to be recognized as. So back in the day, in 1984, this wasn't really such a big thing, you know. So ghosts have no gender. So... <laughs> I don't know. I don't know if it was intentional or not, but I guess the youngsters can make do with anything that is in media to justify their feelings. So, okay, whatever. So anyways, Evo Shendo was ripped in two by Goza. Ooh, talk about being betrayed by your... Um, your god. So, I don't know. It, it just... It just, I feel sorry for Evo Shendor. I mean, he put so much effort to try and survive for the years that since he built all those buildings to open a gateway for Goza and he just dies this way. Mm. <laughs> Anyways, um, yeah. Phoebe destroys diner sign to spell sinners. So, as you guys can see in the trailers, the diner is called Spinners. So when she went around with the Ecto-1 in the gunner seats while trying to catch Muncher, she accidentally blasts, you know, property, of course destroying property as per the usual Ghostbuster standards. <laughs> it's just tradition, you know, just to destroy property. Uh, even in the Ghostbusters, the video game, you just blast everything and like, oh, I'm racking up damaged property. <laughs> it's one of the fun things and there's an achievement for it as well, so that's pretty cool. Um, so yeah, so she, she accidentally destroys the P in the, the neon lighting for the diner sign and then it, it, it's spelled sinners. So it's kind of a very interesting take you know, and all the biblical stuff and all that kind of stuff in Ghostbusters. So that's pretty cool. Um, it was a pretty quick scene. So if you don't really pay attention to it, it, it took me two viewings to really reconfirm what it spelled out. So that's pretty interesting. <laughs> I, I might have to watch it for a third time, which is tomorrow. <laughs> so, to reconfirm what other letters are left behind aside from the red neon light um, on the banner. So, right, moving along. Um, ghosts can grab proton streams? Okay. Um, I, I think it's not a new thing. I think it has been seen before in like the real Ghostbusters, extreme Ghostbusters. Basically, um, if you guys know how the proton streams work, basically the the neutrino one or the proton pack blasts blast out um, neutral um, new neutrons. Basically, it's a nucleus of an atom with no charges around it, so um, that's why it's called a neutrino one. Um, and yeah, the neutrons will actually pick up like the electrons that are attached to the ghost 
because everything is made out of atoms, right? So some science knowledge here. So the neutrons will pick up the excessive electrons to balance out the charges. So um, because ghosts are charged um, spirits, because you know you know how Ghostbusters great you know, ghosts like um, um, Phantasm Five or something like that. Some you know all the all the terminology that Ray throws Ray throws out. Um, when you can see a ghost, it is pretty highly charged. That like the scene in Ghostbusters Two where they had the Scolari brothers and they are tossing the chairs in the courtroom. You cannot see them. Um, because they are not fully charged. They are just uh, entities that can still move items around, but you can't see them. When you finally can see their full form, that's when they are technically very fully charged. Uh, so the proton streams are there to neutralize the charges, uh, making them weaker so they are easier to capture, that kind of stuff. So that's basically the science of the proton pack. Um, and yeah so it's pretty interesting that the ghost um we we see muncher do this in the beginning then of course we get to see it happen again in with gozer so they are able to grab the proton streams and pry themselves free so that's pretty interesting i mean like i said it's not something technically new i think i recall seeing it in the ghostbusters cartoons before um, but it's been years since I, I definitely need a rewatch. Um, but yeah, so it was a pretty interesting concept. I guess it's something new for those who have only followed the live action movies. So this is definitely pretty interesting stuff um, for some new fans and some old fans who have never seen the cartoons. So while editing the video, I kind of noticed that I left out certain information. Um, so I'm here to fill you guys in. Uh, I've actually written down the notes here on my phone just in case I forgot to talk about them again. Um, so why Ghostbusters Afterlife is technically Ghostbusters 1.5 instead of Ghostbusters 4. Uh, and of course, why is it supposedly to be number 4 instead of 3? Uh, technically, the third movie is Ghostbusters the video game. So a lot of hardcore Ghostbusters fans who have played Ghostbusters the video game have technically called it movie number three and why the video game is movie number three is because it is actually written uh, by the original writers of ghostbusters one and two uh dan Aykroyd and of course harold ramis which is the late egon spangler so and the video game reprised all four ghostbusters in to that video game so technically it is Ghostbusters 3 and it actually continues off the timeline from Ghostbusters 1 and 2 uh, in the movies. So technically the video game is the third movie and that's why Ghostbusters Afterlife is technically number 4. Uh, of course without the inclusion of 2016. <laughs> so why Ghostbusters Afterlife is actually movie 1.5 is because uh, the movie omits Ghostbusters 2 even though they show Ray's occult bookstore, which is only shown in Ghostbusters 2. And yeah, that's why it's it's a very strange placement. Um, and technically, Ghostbusters Afterlife is the follow-up for Ghostbusters 1984. <laughs> so the next thing I have is actually... Um, Extreme Ghostbusters is the actual Baton Pass series. So like I was saying in the portion of the um, spoiler review here, uh, don't mind me, I'm going to try and rest my arm because holding the phone while recording is not an easy task. Um, so yeah, so Extreme Ghostbusters, if you guys have not watched the cartoon series, it's definitely a must watch for any Ghostbuster fan. If you have missed out on it, you are really missing out a lot of stuff. Because Extreme Ghostbusters is technically the scariest Ghostbuster IP. Um, it's even scarier than the original first two films. And of course, um, even Afterlife doesn't, you know, take the cake off the horror element. So Extreme Ghostbusters is the scariest Ghostbusters uh, property. And, you know, it it's actually the proper 
series that actually Baton passes the franchise to a new generation of Ghostbusters. Ghostbusters Afterlife, even though it's supposedly promoted to be um, the Baton Pass series for the live action show. Um, but from no matter how many times I've watched it, well, technically I've watched it twice, I, I don't see how it's a Baton Pass uh, movie because technically the kids who are, you know, using the proton packs um, and introducing themselves into the legacy of the Ghostbusters, um, they're still too young to pick up the role um, because, well, they can't move to New York. Um, like, I, like I will talk about later, um, when Winston actually brings the actor one back to New York City and buys over the old firehouse to start up a brand new team of Ghostbusters, um, there was no way for the four kids who live in Somerville now, uh, especially even if it's Egon's family, um, you know, Trevor and Phoebe, it's impossible for them to move because they've incurred Egon's debt and it's no way to easily recover from that. Uh, and of course, um, the Lucky is fourth generation dumb, so <laughs> she's stuck there. And there's no way for her, her, her dad, who is the police officer in Somerville, to move to New York City as well. Um, uh, we have no idea who podcast parents are. I don't think they will take light to moving to New York as well. Um, city life compared to countryside life, it's very different. Uh, a lot more demanding, even financially. So, and they're just kids. They're just kids. There's no way for them to move there on their own decision. Um, so yeah, it's definitely not a bait and pass to the four characters we are introduced into this movie. Um, it's definitely a setup to towards a new generation of Ghostbusters in the upcoming film, if there is ever one. So yeah, and it feels like Extreme Ghostbusters is technically the Bait and Pass series. Like I said uh, earlier on, I think, uh, or is it later? I can't remember which part of the the review that I actually mentioned that I feel like Extreme Ghostbusters is likely likely to be the next live action series if they were ever to do it. And then of course Winston is going to take charge because um, Egon is no longer around. So yeah, and. Technically, what we see in the finale for Ghostbusters Afterlife has already been done before. If you guys have seen Extreme Ghostbusters, the last two episodes, you will know what I'm talking about. So technically, it hits the right spot again, technically. So yeah, moving on. Um, so let's see. Uh... Acto 1 headline scene is not in the final. So, yeah, I actually wrote down here that it says, like, um, the Acto 1 headlight scene. So, in the trailers, we actually showed, like, the iconic Acto 1 headlights when the, the shutter, the shutters of the firehouse opens and then you see the bright light from Acto 1. Uh, it's been used in Ghostbusters 1, Ghostbusters 2, even 2016. And, of course, even... In the trailers for Ghostbusters Afterlife, it was used like that to promote. But surprisingly enough, that scene was actually removed from the final cut of the film. <laughs> so the iconic Ecto-1 um, release uh, out into the wild, it's not there in the final film of Ghostbusters Afterlife. So that's pretty strange. Um, and of course, the one thing that really, really bummed me out about this movie is... Slimers are not in it. Slimer is not in this movie. So where is my buddy Slimer? Even though if he's supposed to return as the angry ghost as he was first introduced in Ghostbusters 1984, um, it would have been nice to see Slimer in this movie. In fact, it's pretty strange that he's not in this movie because um, in America, they do sell plushies for this movie. In And Slimer is actually one of the plushies, including Muncher. So... It's pretty strange that Slimer is not in this movie. In fact, there's one other thing I need to talk about that I've not written in this notes that I just remembered. Um, is that the amount of ghosts in Ghostbusters Afterlife is a lot lesser than 1984 Ghostbusters. In fact, the amount of ghosts that the Ghostbusters fight, or rather the new team or the, the kids actually battle, is only Muncher. 
and Gozer. There's only two. While the 1984 Ghostbusters, they they fought Slimer first, then of course there's the, there's the whole um, sequence where they run around New York City hunting ghosts, clearing ghosts from whatever property that is being haunted or you know whatever business is being affected by ghosts. Um, there's a whole bunch of them. And Ghostbusters Afterlife is lacking a lot of ghosts in this movie. Uh, there's not a lot of ghost battles. If, even the iconic... Uh, Stay Puft Marshmallow Man, which is which is technically the second, um, the second last boss fight before the the main one, which is Gozer. Um, yeah, there's there's really not a lot of ghost busting in this movie, except for you know Muncher and technically Gozer at the end. Uh, I wouldn't count the Terror Dogs as a ghost bust because you know the Terror Dogs and Gozer are technically the same being they need to be together in order to you know form a physical body for gozer so yeah so yeah what do you guys think anyways um same thing let me know in the comments i'm gonna return you to my past self on the, the review all right moving along um dana and peter are married so yes like i said somewhere in the review there are two end scene sequences. So the first one, basically, you will see Sigourney Weaver um, holding up the cards that Peter Venkman has been using in the 1984 Ghostbusters movie when he was still in the university. Um, he's trying to research the effects on emotional status on psych psychokinesis. I I don't know. So uh, psychic powers, basically. So. They have, you know, we are so familiar with the cards, so the wavy lines, the star, the circle um, that Peter Venkman used in the university to try and hook up with his students. And of course, that scene is now used as one of the end credits where Dana Barrett apparently is married to Peter Venkman because both of them are wearing wedding rings. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> and they are sitting in an apartment and they are using the shocker device where well, Dana Barrett is using it on Peter Venkman and then she's holding up the cards so guess guess this now so yeah so Peter being a trickster as he is he guesses all the cards right of course Dana shocks him no matter how because she knows him well enough he she knows that he's conned the game <laughs> So that's a very nice throwback for an end sequence to the original 1984 film. And of course, we are talking about the last thing here. The last end sequence where um, uh, Janine Melnitz meets up with Winston, who has apparently become very successful as a businessman. He has opened up a very big company um, and he has a lot of dough. So apparently he is the one who has been paying... Um, raise mortgage <laughs> um, for his shop and of course a bit of Egon's finances when he was out in Somerville uh, trying to protect the world so the person who's actually really kept in contact with Egon's business is actually Winston and Janine because Winston is the first person Janine is the the middleman and Egon of course you know, is being the one that is looked after by Winston. Uh, so that's pretty interesting as an end credit sequence. Then, of course, the end credit sequence goes into uh, Winston buying the old firehouse back. That's why uh, earlier when I mentioned that um, Ray mentioned that the old firehouse has now been turned into a Starbucks, doesn't make sense because in the end sequence, the second end sequence, Winston buys back the old firehouse to rebuild Ghostbusters, the franchise, um, to start up a new team. And the, the firehouse is deserted, dusty. It doesn't look like it has been built into a Starbucks before. And what's more interesting is the end sequence ends on the containment, containment unit back in the firehouse in the basement. It's still on and it's blinking red. So it's trying to build up to say that there is probably a next Ghostbusters project plan, uh, which I'm definitely looking forward to. I, I know there's probably going to be another sequel. Um, a lot of people have mentioned this in their reviews, 
they say that Ghostbusters Afterlife is a movie about passing the baton on to the new generation. But personally for myself, it doesn't feel that way. Because Phoebe, Trevor, Lucky and Podcast are all back in Somerville when Winston brings the Ecto-1 back to New York City to the old firehouse in the end credit sequence. Um, the kids definitely can't go to New York because, well, uh, the Spangler family is still broke. Even though they saved the world, they still have no money, they still have to pay the debts for, for Egon's um, bills and their own personal money issues as well. Podcast is stuck there because his family technically is not revealed to us. So his mom and dad doesn't, doesn't know that he, he has helped the Ghostbusters and he cannot definitely leave Somerville for New York City if he wants to. Um, lucky, the dad doesn't know that she was part of the Ghostbusters thing um, and she is technically fourth generation, um, you know, Somerville um, dump. So <laughs> that's what she says in the, the movie. So anyways, um, it just doesn't feel like a baton passing movie. Uh, it feels like Winston is setting up to recruit new Ghostbusters. Um, you know, so technically, I feel like the next movie could be, could be, in my opinion, um, the setup for Extreme Ghostbusters live action. Because in Extreme Ghostbusters, sadly to say, the person who has mentored or led the team was Egon Spangler. But because Egon has passed away in the live action series, he can't do that for Extreme Ghostbusters. So, my guess is, could Winston be the one taking up the role of Egon Spangler for Extreme Ghostbusters in the future? Let me know your thoughts in the comment section down below because I would love to talk about all these guys, uh, all these things with you guys. It's really interesting to break down a movie, to discuss the future of the franchise. And of course, did you guys pinpoint all the stuff that I mentioned or did you spot anything else that I missed out? Um, who knows, maybe I will finally find out something new when I watch the movie again tomorrow. <laughs> um, and technically, I'm going to be honest with you, this is the first ever movie um, I've watched in the cinema more than twice. Um, I, I couldn't do it with the original 1984 Ghostbusters because I wasn't even born yet. <laughs> the, the movie came out when I was still uh, swimming somewhere, in, <laughs> you know. And when when I was born, um, the, 1980, uh, the, the second Ghostbusters movie was technically just a few years from releasing. And by the time I got into the Ghostbusters franchise, I started off with the real Ghostbusters, then I moved backwards and realized that, oh, the live action movie was the first introduction to Ghostbusters and not the real Ghostbusters. So, mm, yeah, so that's how I got into Ghostbusters. It was true. The real Ghostbusters, so yeah. <laughs> so this shirt is really, um, really precious to me because that's, that's my route to Ghostbusters, the franchise. So anyways, guys, thank you guys for joining me on this very, very long review. Um, I know it's a lot to take in, but I hope that you guys enjoy the movies for yourself personally. Um, because it's a fun movie. It's a good movie. It may not be perfect at certain points, but it's definitely on a higher note than most movies for me recently. Um, Ghostbusters Afterlife hits all notes perfectly for a hardcore Ghostbusters fan like myself. For a regular movie viewer, maybe not so much because if you don't really understand the 1984 film, you might miss a lot of things uh, and especially you might find all the nostalgia um, throwbacks to be a bit annoying but it was necessary and it was done respectfully and beautifully. So guys, thank you guys so much for joining me on this first ever movie review or rather media review on my youtube channel here uh if you guys like to see more let me know as usual in the comment section down below especially all your thoughts on what we have discussed be it spoiler free or spoiler filled uh have you watched the film how many times are you planning to go and watch it and 
Let me know if you want me to review anything else. Maybe the original 1984 Ghostbusters or the Ghostbusters 19, um, 1989 Ghostbusters 2. Um, or if you really want me to do my <laughs> 2016 Ghostbusters answer the call. Uh, let me know in the comment section down below bye <laughs> guys thank you guys if you guys watched through the entire thing you guys are awesome uh if you hit the subscribe button as well you guys are even more awesome uh, is that even a word but anyways <laughs> until next time i'll see you guys soon bye